Hello and good day to you once again, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. I am glad to be with you as we continue our journey reading through the Bible in 2021. I'm recording for Tuesday, March the 2nd. We pray that your week is blessed so far. Uh, by the end of the month, we'll be in springtime officially. And maybe the weather's already warming up to feel a little bit more like spring. Um, I don't hugely enjoy the windy days, but after the wind dies down, we get some beautiful blue skies. All the pollution is blown away. Um, looking forward to heaven where the beauty will be magnified and those bad aspects will be gone permanently. But we've got four wonderful chapters to go through today. We're uh, reading through Exodus 13, Job 31, Luke 16, and 2 Corinthians 1. Starting a new book today, although it's to the same group that would the last uh, 1 Corinthians was too. So let us pray and ask the Holy Spirit to infuse our minds and our hearts with the lessons that God would have in store for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for a chance to meet once again with the brothers and sisters of the Anaheim and Orange SDA churches, albeit here over the screen. We do thank you for the technology that facilitates our fellowship, as well as the Holy Spirit, who is not bound by time or space or distance. Um, Thank you, Lord, that we can be of one heart and of one faith, and we can be walking through the Bible in your truth and in your faith. So please, dear Lord Jesus, please conform our hearts to reflect yours. Uh, help us to put away preconceived ideas, but to drink deeply from the well that you provide us in your word. Um, thank you that we're reminded of principles that um, we may forget or overlook if we're not in a Bible reading plan intentionally. I am being blessed by this day by day and week by week. We pray safety, we pray health, we pray faith and strength for each of the families participating here and also our broader families at Anaheim and Orange. We love, dear Lord Jesus, the brotherhood of believers all around the world. We know that you hold us so highly in your eye that we are the apple of your eye and we're blessed to know you and be your children. So please bless us as we go through this today. Pray uh, that we will be impressed with great uh, impressions of truth, dear Lord Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's start with Exodus chapter 13. The Israelites have just come out of Eden, of Egypt, and I mean only just come out of Egypt. And here, fascinatingly, Yahweh says to Moses in verses 1 and 2, Consecrate every firstborn male to me. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. You remember that all of the firstborn in Egypt died. Uh, the destroyer, which is called Abaddon in Hebrew, went through. And if those doorposts were not covered with blood, those lintels, uh, then the firstborn died. And so those lives that were saved... God now says, those belong to me. This is fascinating. This is kind of like a plan A for uh, the priesthood uh, before you get the tribe of Levi. I think it's in Leviticus that we get the tribe of Levi being established, and that would be appropriate why it's called Leviticus. Um, but the plan A was for every family to have a priest in the family. The firstborn son, uh, I guess, yeah, firstborn male. Firstborn sons would be priests in every family. It's kind of a beautiful vision, but we actually see God do an exchange later. In exchange for all the firstborn, I'll take the tribe of Levi, and the numbers didn't quite match up, and so there's something to be done with just a little bit of uh, imbalance in those numbers. We'll see that as we keep moving on here, but that's fascinating. Moses goes and tells the people, commemorate this day, this day you came out of Egypt, the land of slavery, because Yahweh brought you out of it with a mighty hand. And so um, it talks about keeping this ordinance perpetually. Don't be eating any yeast. God is bringing you to a land that, yes, has enemies in it, but also great richness. Here's that description of the land flowing with milk and honey, right? The most luxurious, sweet, and uh, creamy items that were in the ancient world there. So don't be eating any yeast. Uh, and every year you celebrate this, no yeast in the camp for a week. Uh, tell this to your children too and remind them this is what I do this because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that this law of Yahweh is to be on your lips. Now this is interesting because Jewish people literally will take scrolls and wrap them and have it on their hand and have it on their forehead when they pray. 
We believe that, and it says like a sign, right? We believe that the hand represents the actions. Obviously, the work that we do is the work of our hands. And that the forehead represents the thoughts. Later on, when we see uh, the seal of God in the book of Revelation, it will be on the forehead. But when the mark of the beast comes in Revelation 13, it can be on the hand or on the forehead. And so it says, for Yahweh brought, oh, and it's to be on your lips. You are to be talking about it. Right? This is to be discussed. For Yahweh brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. Uh, let's see. After Yahweh brings you, this is verse 11. After Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, uh, you are to give to Yahweh the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to Yahweh. Redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey. And I was wondering about this one. Donkeys, I believe, are sterile when they are born uh, because they are a crossbreed between two different species. So they themselves will not be having offspring. So he said you can substitute a lamb in because you don't want to be killing those animals that can't produce offspring anyway. So fascinating. Uh, and then it talks again about the children asking you, why are you doing this? And uh, this is to be a symbol on your forehead that Yahweh brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. So, let's see, verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the shortest route through the Philistine country because God was worried that the people would get discouraged facing a big uh, opposition group, a big war, and turn, their, turn around and go back to Egypt. So God took them a longer route toward the Red Sea. The literal translation of Red Sea is the Sea of Reeds. Um, so, reed almost sounds like red, but there's no red color to it if you were to go and see it. But it was called the Sea of Reeds, uh, later became famously known as the Red Sea. Here's something interesting, and I had forgotten about this until I was reading, and of course it hit me. Verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. And that's in Genesis chapter 50. So all these hundreds of years later, they still had that box of bones and they took it and went on up out of Egypt with Joseph's bones. Let's see. So they uh, leave Sokoth, which I believe means comfort, and they camped at Ethan at the edge of the desert. By day, Yahweh went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. By night, a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Fascinating. If you've been in desert places, you know that the temperature fluctuates hugely in dry climates. Whereas a humid place may have 20 degrees of difference between day and night, the dry places can have 30 to 40 degrees difference. So very hot days, very cold nights, but what alleviates the heat? The shade of the cloud. And what alleviates the freezing cold temperatures? The warmth of the fire. So God is uh, not only a guiding presence, but a comforting presence, both uh, giving relief from heat and cold during this time they're out there in the desert. I believe this is kind of a perpetual um, way that God led them. <coughs> and it's fascinating to imagine the perpetual miracle in front of their eyes. We're going to be reading about many rebellions. One time I tried to count all the rebellions in the uh, remaining books of the Pentateuch here, and I think I gave up after like 18 times. And they're, you know, criticizing Moses, criticizing God. Is God even with us? Is God even leading Moses? And it's like, you have a daily miracle in front of your eyes. How can you deny it? You're getting manna every day. I'm spoiling some future chapters here. But um, it's incredible how the people could be so obstinate in the face of miracles constantly. Uh, but it goes to show we get very used to, very quickly, something that would be extraordinary upon first sight. After some weeks and months and years, yeah, 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 there's that thing like always. Strange to me to imagine, but this is apparently what happens. So, All right, so neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So, you know, uh, pretty soon we're going to, well, I don't want to give away the next chapters. But when the people say, Moses, <laughs> you led us wrong. Moses is like, look at the big thing. <laughs> I wasn't choosing. God was choosing where we went. So, All right. We're going to continue to see some incredible stuff, including tomorrow. Moving on now to Job chapter 31. 
We have another chapter of Job giving a long oratory. I think this is something like four chapters in a row. And this, I was surprised, is the last big long chapter that Job speaks. Um, there's 10 chapters left in the book. What's going to happen with the last 10 chapters? Well, we'll talk about that as we get to it. Sorry, I can't do two things at once. Job, Psalms, Proverbs. There we go. Job 31. Here we go. So, uh, Job has been talking about in the last chapter all of his righteousness, all of his compassion, all of his mercy, all of his wise judgment. He used to be uh, honored in the place. And so this chapter picks up. Let's remember that the chapter distinctions are not original to the text. Those were added hundreds of years later for quick reference, right? These verse and chapter designations. Uh, so they're, they help us find things quickly and easily, but don't in your mind separate chapter 31 from chapter 30. So Paul has been, or Job has been giving quite a laundry list of all the ways he's been righteous. And here's another one. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Of these many, many things that he's, you know, claiming his righteousness before God and therefore his suffering is undeserved, he talks about keeping his eyes pure. This harkens to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, that to even look at a woman lustfully is sin in your heart, adultery in your heart. And so this is an interesting way of saying it, making a covenant with your eyes not to behold lustful things. Um, uh, I've read some books on, you know, male temptation, and that is a big one for male. We're very visually oriented. And, you know, it's, there's different levels of it, obviously, right? A big level is to get in your car and go to a strip club. That's like obviously intentionally going to it. Or, unfortunately, technology makes it all too easy. A couple of clicks on the mouse or a couple of clicks on the remote, you can be seeing nudity and lusty stuff there. But even just in regular everyday situations, right? You see people scantily clad or something and you want to gawk at them and stuff. I have been careful about what I call the second glance, right? We all look around as we're out and about, but when I see somebody who is, you know, dressed in a provocative way, I, I really, you know, you glance, it's, it's almost like you realize what you see a moment after you see it, so you glance away and then you realize what you saw and then you take that second glance. I think the problem is in the second glance. And it's not as bad as intentionally going to it, definitely. We don't want to be doing that. But I, even as a man, try to control the second glance. And, um, you know, there are days I'm pretty successful and days I'm not successful. My flesh can be weak sometimes. Uh, I'm always in open dialogue with God about that because uh, those temptations are everywhere. They're everywhere. So... But let's strive. The Lord knows our strivings. He knows our inner hearts. Uh, he knows when we would actually prefer not to see it, right? Now, sadly, some cultures and some religions have uh, responded to this temptation by covering their women up, you know, with like tents the whole time. I don't think that's the solution. Uh, to take away the temptation really tends to exacerbate it. It seems like the stuff... Um, well, those, those uh, cultures, it's not like they put away their lust when they cover up the women like that. They have just as much uh, uh, problem with, um, how do you say, like pornography and addiction and, and things like that. So, so uh, then he goes into a long, most of the chapter is a series of if, like, if I have not, let's, let's read a couple here, five and six. If I have walked with falsehood, or my foot has hurried after deceit, let God weigh me in honest scales, and he will know that I am blameless. So there's a lot of like, if this is so, let this happen. And a lot of them are cursings, right? Um, so he has several here. If my pet steps have turned from the path, verse seven, if my heart has been led by my eyes, or if my hands have been defiled, then may others eat what I have sown, and may my crops be uprooted. So he welcomes the punishment, he welcomes the judgment if he is guilty. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, verse 9, or if I have looked at my, lurked at my neighbor's door, then may my wife grind another man's grain. That's an interesting way of, of saying it. And may other men sleep with her. Yikes. Like, you know, that, he's like, let that be my punishment if I have been unfaithful. For that would have been wicked, a sin to be judged. It is a fire that burns to destruction. Now, my study Bible here had a little footnote, and I looked down, and it said, Abaddon, the same destructive force that is described in Egypt in the Ten Plagues. 
So I, what we have come to know as the angel of death is this concept in Hebrew of Abaddon. And it's just interesting that uh, Job mentions it here. Also last night in family worship in the blue books, uh, it's, it's something about like King David and Absalom. Uh, talked about Abaddon again. And there's something like only five references in the scripture, yet I've found three of them in like two and a half days. I'm like, Lord, are you trying to teach me something here? But uh, chapter 31 continues with these different statements of if I have done this, then let this punishment fall upon me. Several of them have to do with compassion, uh, looking down through the teen verses and into the 21s. Um, you know, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, Knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall off at the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. Verse 23, for I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor, I could not do such things. I've always known about the judgment, and I've, you know, kept far away from sin, Job is saying. Uh, the next several throughout the 20s are about uh, what you trust, right? Do you trust material wealth? Do you give homage to heavenly bodies like, you know, other gods? Uh, what about enemies? Verse 29, if I had rejoiced at my enemy's dis misfortune or gloated over trouble that came to him. Uh, and there's a lot of these if statements, right? Most of these are if statements, and then there are some of these then statements. Last few verses of Job's great oratory here, verse 35, oh, that I had someone to hear me. I now sign my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Now, Job is still equating God with being his accuser. Job does not know about the conversation that happened in chapter 1 and 2 that we know. Satan is the actual accuser. In fact, the name Satan is Ha-Satan, which in Hebrew means the accuser. So it's fascinating that he says, let my accuser confront me in court. Let, me, let him put his complaint in writing. Um, he thinks he's challenging God, but he's actually challenging Satan. So, um, Surely, I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. So if I could get a hearing, I would proclaim the judgment because I'm so sure it would be in my favor, you know. So uh, last few verses here, a couple more, more of these if then let statements. If my land cries out against me and all its furrows are wet with tears, if I have devoured its yield without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants, then let briars come up instead of wheat and stinkweed instead of barley. Now the words of Job are ended. So I glanced ahead. What are we going to get the next several chapters? A new person is going to come on the scene and a young person, let's remember that in the honor honor-centered worldview that age is a source of honor. And so he's going to become a young, going to come a young person to disrespect Job who is older. Very backwards. Just should not happen in an honor slash shame society. So Elihu is going to talk for about five chapters and then God is going to come and speak for the last few chapters. So that's going to be really fascinating. All right, stick with us through the book of Job. It's books like the book of Job, for which I'm glad that we're reading from different parts of the Bible at the same time. Because to do four chapters a day of just Job would be pretty difficult, you know. So that's why. Some people ask me at the beginning of the year, why don't we just read through the Bible? Well, there are some parts that would be pretty tough. You know, some places are just rich with blessings, diamonds, pearls all over the place. But then Job, I mean, it's just chapter after chapter, gnawing, suffering. And... You know, we're, we're blessed because we can just read it on a page and leave it when we want to. Job could not get away from his suffering. Wow. Let's move on to the New Testament now, Luke chapter 16. We've just gotten through some of the most beloved parables of Jesus in Luke 15. We spent a little extra time on the parable of the prodigal son. This chapter also has parables. I would say this chapter has two of the toughest parables, and I'm going to do my best with them, but I'm open to suggestions on what these parables might mean. Don't forget, you can always comment below. We'd love to have a forum there where we have a conversation going. The first parable is about a shrewd manager. And I remember this parable because our former ministerial secretary at the conference, who also pastored at Anaheim Church before, he really encouraged pastors to get on a Bible preaching calendar, where the calendar determines which passages you preach on. Because if pastors are just picking and choosing what passages they preach on, they'll preach on the early, the easy sections, and the sections that have, you know, clear meanings and clear benefits. This first parable of Luke 16 was one of the toughest ones, and I guess I might as well say it because he was here at this church too. Ernie Furness loved preaching out of the calendar, 
the lec uh, let's see, I think it was called the lector lecture calendar. Anyway, and uh, he told me one week that he was here at Orange that he was preaching on this passage, which is one of the most difficult passages to preach on. What does this parable mean? Of course, when Jesus' hearers left hearing almost all of his parables for the first time, they would say, what did that mean? A good Samaritan and seeds being cast? What does that mean? Most of these parables, we've extracted out the lesson, and okay, we get it. This is one, though, that still makes me scratch my head and wonder. And I think God wants us turning it over in our heads, discussing, you know. So let's do that, even if it's here online. So there's a shrewd manager. I would say, there's a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. So the manager goes to the debtors of the rich man and he reduces all the debts, right? Uh, it says, <laughs> the first person, he reduces his debt from 900 gallons of olive oil to 450, so half of the debt. Then the second debtor, uh, 1,000 bushels of wheat. Lower it to 800. And so when these people paid the lowered amount, then the master commended this dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He had brought in the money. It was lesser amounts, but he had brought it in. For the people, and this is Jesus talking, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, Jesus says, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So, you know, this manager, it wasn't his resources to give away. It wasn't his debt to forgive. But he gets commended by the owner for doing it. How we apply this to daily life, I'm mostly at a loss. Uh, interesting that Jesus is teaching at the end of it, use worldly wealth to gain friends. Um, sure, that, you know, uh, I would say use worldly wealth to benefit the poor, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, get people to like you for it, and then that'll commend you to heaven at the end, apparently, <laughs> you know. So this is a challenge. Jesus goes on to talk about being entrusted, and we just finished our sermon series. If you've been watching on our YouTube channel, two weeks ago we finished a month-long series called Entrusted. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So the Lord entrusts us with little bits to, to test our trustworthiness, and we show Him how trustworthy we are. So, several of these teachings we're going to see through here reflect teachings on the Sermon on the Mount. It's interesting how in Matthew, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is glopped together as three solid chapters of red letters, whereas in Luke, the same teachings are kind of sprinkled throughout. But this next teaching and a couple others we're going to see uh, are gathered together there in Matthew, but they're sprinkled throughout here. So, Jesus is still talking about money. Um, remember, we talked about one out of seven verses in Luke is about money. So, just uh, was a big thing in, in Luke's mind, apparently. Also, Jesus had lots to say about it. No one can serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the first one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we have to use money, obviously. We've got to pay the bills, got to fill the gas tank, you know, all these different things. But who do you ultimately serve at the end of the day? I pray that it is clear, both by your spending patterns and by your thought patterns, who our God actually is. In fact, when Jesus says this, he actually said the word mammon. If you read it in KJV, it'll say you can't serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Mammon was the Greek god of money. So if these people were living for money, they were living for the god of money. And Jesus is straight up saying that's idolatry. You're, you're, you're serving another god if you're serving money rather than the god of heaven. Now, verse 14, the Pharisees who loved money were hearing this and they were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves before others in their eyes, but God knows your heart. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So these guys were kind of money grubbers. They wanted to be, you know, wrapped in luxury and, of course, get respect. Uh, wealthy people were viewed as like right next to God because like they must be so holy because God has blessed them with material abundance. But God, Jesus says it's, it's, he doesn't say it's the opposite, but the thing that we pine after and, you know, long to ab absorb and accumulate, it's detested by heaven, you know. Um, let's see. 
Uh, he talks about the law and the prophets uh, proclaimed until John the Baptist. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom is being preached. Uh, and everyone is forcing their way into it. I was thinking what to do with that phrase. <laughs> I think everybody's trying to be saved. Jesus said before, enter through the narrow door. We know that grace through his sacrifice is the only way to do it. But look at uh, verse 17. This is also, this is important for us as Adventists. We often remember and recite this verse when Christians of other denominations encourage us to throw out the Old Testament. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. So God's law is perfect. That's affirmed many times in Scripture, and it was, it was communicated to us perfectly. As we get into Leviticus, we're going to see that we have to make a distinction between certain laws. We'll see. We'll see. Verse 18 uh, tough teaching, one of Jesus' toughest teachings in the Sermon on the Mount here. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. You are breaking a commandment. People do all sorts of justifications for why, but Jesus lays it out there, right? And the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus does not mince words. Stick with your original spouse. Uh, God says in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, I hate divorce. Divorce causes so much relational tearing and pain, years for people to get over this identity crisis. My best friend living across the street when I was a kid, his father divorced his mom to go be with somebody at work, and for years, you know, he was so miserable and so sad. Um, if nothing else, for the sake of your kids, stay with your spouse. Man. So... <laughs> now we go to another parable, and if we thought the last one was hard, this next parable is probably the parable that most Adventists wish was not in the Bible. Sometimes I scratch my head and like, Lord, why did you say this parable? But it's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Have you read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? I'm not going to read the whole thing, because the idea is that you've read it before we watch this video. But this is particularly problematic for our view on state of the dead and hell. We believe that we fall into an unconscious sleep until Jesus comes to wake us up. Wicked will not be wakened. Wicked dead people will not be wakened up at Jesus' coming. They will be awakened a thousand years later, and there will be a lake of fire that consumes them, but that's far, far in the future. Jesus seems to be saying in this parable that right when you die, you go to heaven or hell based on how good or bad you've been, and that it is already burning. And so many times it can be a hurdle. Uh, if you're trying to give like baptismal Bible studies, they'll say, well, what about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? <laughs> Sometimes they're like, oh, they know that parable. Jesus, why did you say that parable? But here is why Jesus told the parable. We're actually going to see in the last verse the reason for the parable. So uh, this, this was done for me when I was a, uh, a Bible student at Adventist Academy. I think I was a junior. I remember this day in class specifically, and it's still the method that I use. We say, okay. If Jesus was telling a, a true story rather than just a, uh, you know, a hypothetical imaginary story that has a moral, let's take it literally, okay? So if we're going to understand literally that people die and go to heaven or hell, let's see what this parable says. First of all, oh yeah, even before the characters die, let me just read 19 and 20. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple. Purple was the hardest color to get in Bible times. Ironic that I'm wearing purple today. Totally coincidental. Uh, purple and fine linen and lived a luxury every day. At his gate was a, laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what the, fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Lazarus, to me, sounds almost like Job, right? Job is covered in these sores that don't heal and stuff. I don't think it talks about dogs licking them. But. So, then both of these characters die. Uh, the poor man, Lazarus, goes to heaven, and the rich man goes to hell. But let's go along with this, and let's assume it's literal. Let's see what it says. It says here, The beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Now, the original word, and it says that if you look in King James or New King James, it actually says Abraham's bosom. Right? Hug somebody, you're at their bosom. Right? Uh, that would need to mean, if heaven is at Abraham's bosom, that would mean that everybody who died has to fit right here at Abraham's bosom. Problematic from the very beginning if you take it literally, is it not? Then, the next one, in Hades, Hades was the Greek god of the underworld. 
Uh, it says the, the rich man was in torment. He looked up and saw Father Abraham far away. Okay, so this means that heaven and hell are in view of each other, if we're taking this literally, right? So that's the second thing that's problematic. Third, he calls to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And said, okay, so heaven and hell are apparently close enough that you can have a conversation between heaven and hell, okay? So if we're taking this literally, then those places can talk to each other. I don't think anybody who believes hell is already existing and heaven is already existing thinks that you can actually talk from one to the other. Have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Here's the fourth problem with believing this literally. One drop off the tip of a finger on the tongue could alleviate the suffering and the agony of hellfire. If you were just in physical earth fire, would one drop do very much to help you? You probably wouldn't even notice it. So there are four problems just in those three verses if you take it literally. So Abraham replies, you know, there's a great chasm between me and you. Nobody can cross it. Apparently you can have a conversation across it and see it, but you can't physically cross it. That would be an interesting construct. Maybe that's the fifth problem there. Um, verse 27, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus back to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them that they may not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, verse 30, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And this verse 31 is the reason Jesus told the parable. And this is in Abraham's voice in the parable, but this is Jesus' real reason for giving it. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, they will not be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. What is Jesus saying? Pay attention to your Bibles and don't throw out the Old Testament. The law and the prophets, those are the two major categories that compose the Old Testament. This is your warning from God, Jesus says. Don't be expecting a supernatural warning. God has done enough. So the whole thing about seances, first of all, the Old Testament says, don't go to people who do seances and communicate with the dead. So if you're keeping your Old Testament, you won't do that. But these people who claim to do it, there will be no actual message of repentance from heaven because that is not how God chooses to operate. He works through his prophets. He works through his word. Praise the Lord. It is nearly universally available around the world right now. Pay attention to the word. Now, I am very comfortable with that moral of the parable. The rest of it is an interesting story, but that's what a parable is. You know, I don't doubt there were lots of women looking for lost coins, but Jesus told a hypothetical story that was an illustration for the kingdom of heaven. I don't doubt that lots of farmers spread their seed, but Jesus was not telling a historical single time that a farmer spread his seed. He's saying, <laughs> you know, imagine the, the common situation of a farmer spreading his seed, but it's not a specific time. So he uses this uh, illustration to make the powerful message about pay attention to the gospel. Would I prefer that the rich man and Lazarus parable wasn't there? Maybe, but I have to submit myself to the idea that God's word is perfect and that there is a redeemable reason why that is in there. So Jesus is wiser than me if he chose to tell that parable and Luke was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down that parable. I need to keep my mouth shut, but that parable causes problems for people who maybe read halfway in the depth, but don't go... They don't, they don't consider how absurd it is to take that fully literally. And secondly, they don't pay attention to the actual moral in verse 31. So, All right, there's my rant <laughs> on the rich man and Lazarus parable. Let's go to our last chapter now, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So we have finished 1 Corinthians, which, which was 16 chapters long, plenty long of a book. 2 Corinthians is to the same group, so it's the same you know, uh, that peninsula on the southeast of Greece, that Peloponnesian Peninsula, it was a harbor town. And so there was a lot of uh, work going on there, a lot of shipping, which creates a lot of wealth. And of course, where there's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of vice. So these Christians are living in this place of vice. It is thought by scholars that Paul wrote 2 Corinthians within one year of 1 Corinthians. So this is pretty close time-wise. You remember at the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul had said, I long to visit you there. Apparently something had changed in Paul's plans and he didn't visit there. And Paul 
In large part, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is responding to criticisms. We're going to see in the second half here of chapter 1 that he's responding to the criticism that the reason he changed his plans is because he's worldly-minded. And many people are surprised with how defensive uh, Paul is in 1 Corinthians. We already know that Paul is the most autobiographical of the New Testament authors, but he's really defensive and he uses strong language to do it. Why is Paul so defensive? First of all, I can sympathize with that. If somebody says something that's wrong, I'm very quick to defend myself. But Paul is not only in it to defend himself, he's in it to defend the gospel. Because he knows that if his own reputation is trashed, the gospel will also be disregarded. The messenger and the message are intertwined, right? Uh, it's amazing, given that Paul's major reason for writing 2 Corinthians is to defend himself against half a dozen rumors or arguments that were going about, around about him, that he has as much inspiration in it as he does. I know a couple of times in my 10 years of ministry, there's been stuff that's come up at board meetings and I get defensive. I am not the least bit inspirational while I'm being defensive. But Paul, this shows, you know, the Holy Spirit working through it, that this is still a council, apostolic council that is worth preserving and worth reading all these centuries later because it's inspiration interwoven with Paul defending himself. In fact, as I read most of the first chapter, it's so inspirational through the first half, you don't even think that Paul, his major objective is to defend himself through, uh, against accusations. But we'll see in the second half of the first chapter that that is true. So this letter starts with the normal form for the ancient world. It starts with who it's from, and then who it's to, and then a greeting or a blessing. So here's the from line. From, I, I, that's my word supply there. It just starts with Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So this letter is sent with two people's names on it, but it's pretty universally believed that it's Paul. There's a lot of I language there for Paul. But he's writing it in both their names. To the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. That whole region over there with that Peloponnesian Peninsula was called Achaia. And here's the greeting, or the blessing. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So we are to be comforted by God through the Holy Spirit, but we're not to be a dead end, right? That blessing isn't supposed to stop with us. We're supposed to spread it out as well and be a comfort to other people. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, let's remember Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you also. And they're experiencing that, right? We've suffered uh, for the sufferings of Christ. So also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. Paul says, don't forget all the trouble and stress and pain that we go through to encourage you and bring the message to you. We're going to see quite a laundry list later on in the book about all that Paul has been through. Um, so let's see. It talks about suffering producing patient endurance. That sounds very similar to uh, the book of Romans, chapter 5 there. And our hope for you is firm, verse 7. Because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so you also share in our comfort. Christians were degraded and derided and misunderstood and accused of falsehood, uh, accused of, uh, you know, even cannibalism, because they would talk about the body and blood of, of Jesus and stuff, and those words would get out. And, yeah, so suffering there, but also praise the Lord, the comfort. Verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the troubles we have experienced in the province of Asia. That's modern-day Turkey. We think Asia is way over in China, but they call Turkey Asia. Still today, it's called Asia Minor. So. We were under great pressure, verse 8, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. They thought their life was over. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. They have learned greater dependence on God through their suffering and through believing that their earthly life was over. Verse 10, he's delivered us from such deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers, that many will give thanks on behalf of the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. 
So then Paul starts talking about his change of plans, how yes, he was planning to visit them, but then a change took place. Verse 16, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. That's southern Jerusalem, southern Israel where Jerusalem is. Verse 17, was I fickle when I intended to do this? He's asking that rhetorical question that's part of the rumor. He's so fickle. Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes and no, no? Let's remember, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. These folks were, I guess, uh, in part disappointed that Paul didn't visit them, but maybe some took it as an excuse to be offended. Look at Paul, he's not doing what he said. Therefore, he's fickle, he's worldly, he's not to be trusted. And so he goes on talking about yes and no, but he talks about with God and his promises, it is always yes. Uh, for no matter, verse 20, how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Let our faith, brothers and sisters, be yes and amen. Yes and amen. If God says it, we say yes and amen. Let it be so. Praise the Lord. Verse 21, now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit. Paul is defending his spiritual call here, his, his calling as an apostle, his Holy Spirit anointing here, guaranteeing what is to come. Verse 23, I call God as my witness. And this is interesting because that's a phrase that I attribute with speaking the Lord's name in vain. Um, you know, unfortunately, the world takes that phrase, and when somebody is just really insistent, they'll say, you know, and forgive me for saying this, I'm just giving an example, swear to God, or God is my witness. But Paul is really saying, I will stand before God and testify this. Very similar to Job, right? I want to be tested in the court before God, right? So... I stake my life on it, verse 23, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. It's for your benefit, he's saying. It would have caused you more cost and difficulty and things like that. So trust me that it was for your benefit that I didn't return to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work for you, for your joy, because it is by faith that you stand firm. All right, this is just a small portion of Paul's explanations of, you know, things that he's accused against, but we're going to see more of these as we keep going. So, fascinating that Paul's change of plans, you know, we get change of plans all the time. Sorry, I couldn't make it, but hopefully we're gentle with each other, right? When we understand, I literally had car troubles with both my cars in the last two weeks. I had to miss some appointments. I also misplaced my phone for like a day and a half, and so I had to call back some of those people late. Uh, but let's be gracious with each other when things unexpectedly have to change, amen? There is some practical counsel from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Similarly, friends, I pray that you stand firm in the faith, always looking to Jesus for inspiration, for strength. Let's close off with prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for having accompanied us by your spirit as we go through these chapters. Not that they aren't challenging, Lord. Uh, Luke particularly today was challenging. We seek, dear Lord Jesus, deeper insight, uh, deeper appreciation, and guidance from you. Perhaps some brothers and sisters can put some comments uh, down below here on the video about what perhaps you meant by either of those parables in Luke chapter 16. Thank you, Lord, that in large part we have an easier time than the early church did and that the early apostles did. I pray we wouldn't take that in vain, Lord, or as an excuse to be lazy, but that it would mean we are all the more encouraged to, to speak up, to stand up, to walk forward in your truth, proclaiming and always giving a good witness to your faithfulness to us. Please bless our families, uh, dear Lord, from the Orange and Anaheim SDA churches. Also, any other friends that are joining us, Lord, this is a tough time to endure through. But just like Paul said there in the first half of 2 Corinthians 1, uh, through the suffering, we are added patient endurance to our faith. I pray that that would be true in each of us. And I pray that we'll come through this strong as ever and even having new reasons to proclaim you in society. Because when we see the world... Uh, and its ways produce suffering, we want to point to the one who has the solution for all of it. 
Thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray a blessing on my brothers and sisters, the remainder of their day, the remainder of their week. May we be reunited, uh, be it Sabbath morning on the out outdoors or hopefully before too many more weeks back in the sanctuary or tomorrow on the screen once again. We pray that you will preserve us and hold us strong in the faith until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, dear friends, for having spent this time together. I love you. I appreciate you. I miss you. Please greet any other family members or church members in the name of Jesus from me, from Pastor Nathaniel, from the Tatum family. We love you, and we pray that things go well for you. Don't hesitate to pick up a phone, write an email, if we can ever serve you. Texts, absolutely. God bless you. Thank you so much. Love you. Bye.